Well, let's begin this four-week series, Lord Send Revival. And really what this series is, is an invitation to pray. That we would pray that you would join in with others from the depths of your heart, asking God Almighty, Lord, would you send revival? Now, revival is a great word if you think about it, you know, to, to be revitalized or to be renewed. You know, you, you were, there was something that was new and then it kind of grew old or flat or stale and then to be renewed or revitalized. There's life. And then what had life becomes dull and lifeless and it is given abundant life again. Do you have any sense in your heart for the need for revival, first in your own soul? I mean, how are you doing these days? And certainly as a church and as a community, even as a nation, do you have the sense that things are not as they should be and that our only hope is found in Jesus? That's, that's what we're going to be talking about this month. And uh, I invite you to, to listen and to learn and to wrestle and and to pray, to really accept the invitation to pray this prayer. Three words, Lord, send revival. From the depths of your heart, a cry to God that he would do something that only he can do. Now, when you think of revival, if you know some church history, you might think of the 18th century revival. It began in, in Britain and a, a great outpouring of God's spirit and people coming to the Lord and society was changed. Came over across the Atlantic into America and kind of known here uh, by the Yanks, you know, we, we call it the Great Awakening. And uh, we need God to do something similar as far as reviving this uh, nation, this world. Uh, there's two observations, you know, you can study revivals throughout church history. A couple observations. One is, is that um, the days that we're in right now actually are perfect for a revival to come. Uh, revivals always seem to come out of a societal darkness, when things were horrible, when the things of God were not being followed, and, and the effects of sin, right, were so evident all over the place, and division, and all kind. Of, it's out of that darkness that the that revival comes, the light of Jesus comes. The second observation is that uh, it, while it's always mysterious, in fact, people, and it's true, you can't you can't orchestrate revival. You can pray for revival, but you can't program it. You can't make it happen. When you study revivals, though, you always seem to, it always kind of, if you pull the threads back to where it originated, there's always a person or a group of people that were crying out to God, praying this prayer, Lord, send revival. And from that person, from that uh, small group of people who found each other praying this same prayer, God responded and moved and act, and society, uh, towns, churches were all renewed, given new life again. Does your heart feel like, Lord, we need you? Lord, would you send revival? Uh, I think it's mysterious, this move of God, and it's true we can't orchestrate revival, but I, I believe it's because we can't know what's going on in the hearts of other people. Even the people that you are in the room with right now, you, you can't know what's going on in their heart or what God is doing in their inner person. But you know what is going on in your heart and in your inner being. Are you walking with Jesus? Are you seeking his kingdom above all other things? And as we know what we can know about our own hearts and as we begin to pray and seek God in this way, People who are seeking and praying for revival seem to find each other, and God hears and answers those prayers. It's like the little Second Chronicles 7 verse, right? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and turn and heal their land, right? Forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, you, you can't know if I'm humble of heart or not. I, but you know if you are humble of heart and seeking God. Uh, so this is how revivals begin. And I'm wondering today if you would be willing for revival to begin with you, even if it wasn't beginning with anybody else. Would you pray, Lord, send revival and may it begin with me? How is your heart toward God these days? Are you walking in a vibrant, healthy, loving, being loved and loving him in return kind of relationship with God? Um, 
We need revival. Revival is when the renewal of individuals' hearts kind of goes wildfire and is widespread. And really, the renewal of our hearts is the opportunity that we are given every day by God. In fact, discipleship is kind of an invitation to be renewed in the inner person each day as we follow Jesus and as we walk with the Lord every day. It's an opportunity for renewal. And revival is just when renewal happens in a person and multiple people, and then it goes wildfire. And wouldn't we like to see that? I, I know I would. I think of the words of Jesus in John chapter 10. He's talking about the enemy, who of course works against this kind of renewal of human hearts. He works against the things that would draw people to God. And he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came that we would have abundant living to renew us from the inside out, to bring us back to life, and he has paved the way for us to happen. Would you pray, Lord, send revival. Now listen, none of us are beyond the need for this. All of us, regardless of our walk with Jesus, we all stand in the need of being renewed from the inside out. None of us have arrived at a place, have we, where our discipleship and our walk with Jesus is to, to a point where we don't need to be renewed. We do. And God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given us his spirit to walk with us and to renew us from the inside out. The text I want you to think with me about is found in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. You can read it on the screen. 1 Kings 19, it's actually the story of Elijah. And you remember one of the greatest prophets ever, uh, God's prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah. And notice, he wasn't beyond the need for renewal. In 1 Corinthians 19, listen to what it says, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. We'll talk about why in a minute. He was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat underneath it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. That he lay down under a, a bush and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some, break, uh, some be bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. Elijah is a prophet of God. And yet here in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, we see him despairing. It's like, I've had enough, Lord. And he, was, he didn't just have enough of being of ministry, of being God's spokesperson. He, he was ready to be done with life. I've had enough. Are you in that place? Now listen, if Elijah, who is a prophet of God, could get to that place, none of us are immune. None of us are beyond, you know, reaching deep, dark places, dark valleys where we need revival. What's crazy about the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19 is the chapter before, chapter 18. That's the chapter where you might know this story. It's pretty famous where on Mount Carmel, there were 450 prophets of Baal, a false god. And there was kind of a, a, a standoff. And there was Elijah, and there was 450 prophets of Baal. And they had two bulls, and they put one on you know, Baal's altar. And then from morning into, into the early evening, they're doing their worship and cutting and asking Baal, because the test was, you know, if you're a god, uh, sends fire and, dis and consumes the offering, then we'll know that your God is true and our God's a liar. Untrue. And they go all day, all night, slicing themselves, all this stuff, you can read about it, and nothing. And then Elijah, who kind of, you got to like Elijah, I do, because he starts mocking them, you know, hey, maybe your God's busy. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's reading the newspaper. Uh, you know, uh, he didn't actually say that. Um, he mocks them, you know, and then nothing. And then Elijah begins to prepare the bull for Yahweh's altar. And he actually repairs the altar uh, to God Almighty. 
prepares the bull, and then he tells others, come and pour, you know, they poured gallons and gallons of water on the, on, on the bull and on the offering. He had dug a trench around it. Why'd you build a trench? He, like four times, he says, pour water on it, pour water on it, to the point where it was so drenched that even the trench had become like a moat. And so then he prays, prayer, prayer of Elijah, and fire comes from heaven, consumes the bull and the altar, and licks up all the water dry. To which the people say, Yahweh, God Almighty is God. The 450 prophets of Baal, they were slaughtered as false prophets, which they were. And there was a great turning. This is the chapter before. You go into chapter 19 and King Ahab, who had kind of observed all this, he tells Jezebel, his wife, everything that Elijah has done. This is verse 1. And how he had killed all the prophets of Baal with the sword. So Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods, small g, plural, may the gods uh, deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And you expect, after this great victory on Mark Carmel, what do you expect? I expect, you know, I expect Elijah to say, bring it on, Jezebel. God is my God. I speak and serve him. Did you miss the fire from heaven? <laughs> and that's not what Elijah does. He's afraid of a woman. A queen, you know, nonetheless, but a woman. And he runs and he's afraid and he hides. And then he gets to this low, dark valley where he says, I'm done with this stuff. I've had enough. I've had enough of ministry. I've had enough of life. Just take me. Elijah needed re revitalization. He needed renewal. And we are people who do... Too. You know, 2020, and, and I'm kind of tired of hearing about it, aren't you? You know, how rough 2020, you know, it's unprecedented and all that. Yeah, it is, and it continues. Um, but for most all of us, 2020 has brought about circumstances that weary our souls and bring us to the point where we just say, Lord, I've had enough. Have you said that at all about any of the circumstances you've endured? Lord, I've just had enough. Uh, 2020 has brought problems and discouragement, and we need revival. And I want to encourage you to pray, Lord, send revival. We need revival. I've recently reviewed, you know, my the last few months of my life, and and it was not a great experience because I kind of made a bullet list, kind of all the things that have brought me to a place more than once to say, I'm tired of this, Lord. I've had enough. You know, we began the year with great optimism, 2020, new decade, all that great stuff. And uh, early on, learned that we were losing a couple of our staff people, which was difficult because, you know, 2017, we had poured so much time and energy into, you know, in prayer, you know, as far as the direction of the church and, you know, what we needed. And those two staff people kind of personified the vision and the enthusiasm of how we wanted to reach our community for Jesus. And then to lose them after, you know, a pretty short time being here, it was, you know, looking back, it's like, yeah, that was tough. And then uh, uh, the ne in early March, you know, Elise and I, we've gone to this Refresh Conference, which is, it had lived up to its name, Refresh Conference. It's for ad adoptive and foster parents, which we we've done for a number of years and uh, to be refreshed. And then it was right at the same time where the whole COVID thing started. And up there in Kirkland actually was like ground zero for the United States of America as far as COVID when it first came to, to uh, our shores. And that's where we went. And the night before the refresh conference was to start, we got a text that it was canceled. It was like, oh. and then for the next 10 days or so, just the, all this COVID news and what it, the implications for the church. In fact, we, we canceled, we didn't have services at all on March 15th. And in those few days uh, leading up to the following week, March 22nd, we figured out how to do church online. And, and then since then, all the weeks after that, just the uh, kind of the intensity and, and what was required just to keep doing this kind of can wear people down and it has. We lead into July 5th, excited. We did in-person services beginning July 5th. And that was a whole new ball of, you know, with the 
protocol documents and the new teams and thank you to the cleaning team that's been faithfully serving week in and week out and for the safety team and for the welcome team. I mean, you, you all have kept serving during these days and I'm so grateful to God for you because those are the kind of things that were needed in order for us to, to do this in-person, you know, service. And, and then, uh, so all that, and then at the end of July, on a personal note, is when uh, um, our family, my wife, was diagnosed with uh, late, uh, late stage melanoma. And just if you've, I mean, if cancer has touched your life, I don't have to explain to you just the difficulty and the struggle, the weariness that all of that brings. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to the church, to our elders, for all the love and support, and uh, just so thankful. But looking back over this calendar year, it's like, whew, Lord, I just had enough. And instead of living in there, it's rather to say, you know what? We need to be revitalized. We need new life into us. We need to be brought back to life. And what I know is that my wife and my children, what they need most from me is a man who is walking with Jesus in this abundant life that Jesus came to bring. What I know for the church family, what they need from their pastor is not great sermons. It's not, uh, you know, perfect leadership or what you need from me is someone who is renewed in my inner man walking faithfully with Jesus. So Lord, send revival. Would you send revival? Now, I, I'll tell you, revivals always begin with a person or a small group of people. So really, this series is for me. And if any of you want to come along, we'll find each other and we'll be praying together this prayer. Lord, send revival. Uh, now, what I, what I believe to be true, <laughs> absolutely, is that there are some, maybe a few, who have been praying this already may have been praying for some time for God to do what only he can do. I think of a pastor I heard, he's uh, from Melbourne, Australia. And he says that back in the 50s, there was a small group of people who were praying for revival, just and consistently asking God to do something in their city, which only he can do, and to reach people and to change the culture, because Melbourne was pretty you know, rough and tumble. And at some point, you know, revival did come, and many people were saved in that city. But he said it was some 50 years or more after these people were praying. He said there's many of those people never lived to see the day for God to answer his, uh, their prayer. And that may be true for us. We may be have, I mean, our heart may be uh, burdened by what's going on these days. You know, I was thinking all the 2020 circumstances interwoven with all of my 2020 you know, circumstances is something that's also been interwoven in your 2020 circumstances, and that is it's an election year. And Tuesday's election day, and it's it's not going to be resolved on that day. And regardless of the outcomes, uh, we've we've got trouble. And we may pray, Lord, revive our nation, bring this nation back to you. And are you willing to pray these prayers, even if you don't see it in your lifetime? I hope that you are. I think we need revival. This is an invitation to pray this prayer. Will you, Lord, send revival? Today I want to talk briefly about what we need and specifically about strength. Because if you find yourself in a place of weariness and brokenness, weakness, what we need is strength. To be revived is kind of a renewal of our strength. To not be beaten down, but to be strong. We need revival because we are discouraged and lifeless and weak. So how do we become strong? I think of uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Do you remember these words? Are you familiar with them? Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. And increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. And young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar 
on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. If you're praying this prayer, Lord, send revival, and it's on the heels of, Lord, I've had enough. If you're feeling weak and weary, well, take heart. If you are faint, God gives strength to the faint. If you're weary, this is who he uh, strengthens, are those who are weary. He increases, Isaiah 40 says, he increases power to the weak. So if you're weak today, you're the prime candidate as you humble your heart to receive power from God Almighty. How does this happen? Well, strength comes, and, and, the, and the strength that comes is a beautiful demonstration here. Uh, when You know, the picture of they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. To be a, someone who's following Jesus, running after him and not growing weary, walking with Christ and not being faint. How do we get this kind of strength? Well, Isaiah 40 says it. Those who hope in the Lord will renew those, their strength. Those who wait on him, those who trust in Jesus, these are the ones whose strength is renewed. He gives power to the weary. As you pray, Lord, send revival, it's an absolute laying down of all the initiative that makes you want to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and make it happen. Make yourself strong. No, it's a, it's a waiting on the Lord. It's a crying out to him from the bottom of your heart, saying, Lord, I can't do this without you. Uh, all throughout the scripture, we see the encouragement, I mean, to Moses and Joshua and Daniel, uh, to David and Solomon, where God says, be strong and courageous. I am with you. God's very presence with us, this hoping, this waiting on the Lord, this is how strength is renewed. You know, last week, appreciate uh Steve and Gabe and Pat preaching the Armor of God series found in, out of Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, I'm wondering if you remember how that whole passage begins. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. When, when Paul goes on to say, you know, take up the full armor of God, because uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual uh, principalities and powers and heavenly places. All of that armor and the reason we need it and the reason it's been provided for us is from comes from Paul's injunction, I mean his plea. Finally, be strong not in yourselves. Be strong not in the circumstances of life because everything's going great. These days have shown us oh, things can change. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, God has mighty power for us. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We need to hope in the Lord. We need to wait on him. We need to pray and watch him work. This is the nature of revival. You see, there's no revival and there's no life, new life, found in being self-sufficient. In fact, self-sufficiency can probably lead us to deep, dark places when we, we're not sufficient. But sufficiency in Christ, that's where strength and power comes from. Renewal happens only as we come to the end of ourselves and realize that we cannot do it. But God absolutely can. We are renewed when we become totally dependent on this strength that God provides. We are renewed when we embrace the fact that we can't live this life in following Jesus apart from the strength that Jesus gives us to follow him. John 15, uh, study that this week, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We need him and his life, his spirit flowing through us to be renewed. That's why we pray first. We pray often because apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. I love Colossians 1, 28, 29. Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Verse 28 is kind of a great uh, mission statement. I mean, we could say this is, who, this is what we do. This is what we want to see. We want to see everyone presented fully mature in Christ. Notice what Paul says. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. So Paul, it's like this divine cooperation. Paul is for sure strenuously contending. 
but he's not contending in his own strength. He says, I'm contending. I'm strenuously contending with all the energy Jesus powerfully works in me. We have to be people who are depending fully on the strength that Jesus provides. We draw strength from him. We draw strength from the one who never grows weary. He does not falter. He does not faint. There is no uh, lack with him. God never comes to the end of himself. We draw strength from the one who never grows weary. Finally, uh, um, maybe you're thinking of this verse already, you know, Philippians 4.13. Paul writes to the Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who, what? Through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's interesting about that, because it's pretty famous, you know, you see some athletes who have that tattooed on their arm. I could do all things. And it's kind of, in the culture, it's kind of quoted as a victory statement, a, fi- a victory chant. You know, a mountaintop. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But if you read the verse before and after, if you read verses uh, 12 and 14, along with Philippians 4.13, what do you get? You see Paul, I think I have it right here. Paul, listen to what Paul is saying. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. Now, Paul wouldn't be saying these things if if he wasn't in a place of needing contentment. I mean, uh, if he was, you know, if everything was, there was no need, there was no want, everything... He wouldn't be writing to the Philippians this way. He's saying, I'm in circumstances that are, that I find myself very needy, but I found myself to be content when I'm needy or when I have everything I need. Uh, And then he says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Verse 14, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Paul had troubles. Philippians 4.13 is not a victory chant. It's a, it's a cry out to God, I, I can do all things. I can endure these troubles through Christ who gives me strength. It's not standing on the mountaintop. It's like falling off the cliff of the mountain and you're hanging on by your fingernails and your strength is giving away, but you're not going to fall. Why? Because you can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can walk through this dark valley. You can walk through this dark valley. It's It's that kind of prayer because of the one who is with you, the one who strengthens you. So what what dark valley are you in today? Lord, send revival. It's an invitation to pray. It's an invitation to admit your own brokenness and weakness and to wait on the one who has all strength, to strengthen you and to strengthen me and to see him change us from the inside out. Um, we're, as we invite you to pray this prayer, you may also have prayer, prayer needs. And we you know, have a, a commitment and a burden to pray for you. And if you go over to info.norkenzie.net, there's a, there's a section right there that talks about you know, revival prayers. And if you click on that and go to the forum, there's a place where you can write out your prayer request. But that, there's no limit on how much you want to write there. And if you want to kind of relive the last few weeks or months or just kind of itemize the struggles that you've been through just because it would be good. Maybe you want to share the backstory uh, along with how we can pray for it. And, you know, you can, you can uh, specify if it's just for the elders or if it's elders and staff or if you want the whole prayer ministry team. We have 40-some people on our prayer ministry team. And if you want these, we, we would love to pray for you this, these, these weeks that God would send revival and strengthen you from the inside out. So this is, a, this is an invitation to prayer. And I'm wondering if you'll say yes to the invitation to pray for revival, but also to ask for prayer for yourself. And then also to pray for others, that God would strengthen them on the inside for his glory. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. For your presence, your consistent strength given to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, our hearts cry out, Lord, would you send revival? Uh, we, We feel the need 
to be renewed in our spirit. We sense the attacks of the enemy against us, against our households, against this church, uh, in this city, Lord. We thank you for the many who are, um, we don't even know how many, but there are people in this city who are praying these prayers too. And we see evidence of your goodness. And we just pray that it would come, that many would come to know you, Lord, and that we'd be able to experience on a day-to-day -day basis this abundant life, Lord Jesus, that you came to bring us. May you put your good news on our lips. May we trust you even when there's, you know, difficult days and maybe no evidence that we should trust you, and yet we trust you. We have not seen you, Lord, but we love you, and we give our lives to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. I want to ask you now just to, if you can, just for a few seconds, in the stillness of this moment, just seek God to wait on the Lord. You may have been rushing ahead, trying to fix things, trying to do things. Would you just, in the next few moments, just lay that all down. Put your hope in the Lord. Wait on him and trust. Trust.